My guests today have photographed some of the most iconic moments in basketball history. They both started working for the NBA in the mid-1980s and continue to document the league's history to this day. Uh, Andrew Bernstein and Nathaniel Butler, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Thanks for having us, Adam. It's yeah. a pleasure to have you both on. Um, now, just for some context, Andy, you previously guested on the podcast uh, going back a couple of years now. It was a great conversation that we had about your history in photography and working with the NBA. Uh, mm -hmm. But Nat, do you mind just uh, detailing? I, I believe if my research is correct, you've been at every NBA All-Star game and NBA finals since 1986. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Every, uh, every one since, since 86. Wow. I started, I started when I was 13. They had no labor laws. then. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you look almost too young to be able to do that. But <laughs> I don't know. Like, well, you know, <laughs> it's fantastic. So when do you first remember meeting one another? Is there a story behind your first meeting? There's a photo that I'd like to show in a moment, which I've found online, I believe through the B and H photo, perhaps there's a great photo that I hope to share in just a moment. God help us. You know, I don't remember that initial meeting that was it. Uh, it was through Terry, Terry Lyons, our dear friend. I, I know that he made the intro. It's funny. Um, I don't remember specifically. Um, there you go. But I think, uh, I think it would have to have been 86 all-star in, in, um, in yeah. Dallas. Dallas. Yeah, I think, you're, then, I think you're right. I think it was. And then, then got to know each other better during uh, 86 finals. Right. Because it, it's not as hectic and then you have an off day or between yeah. games or something. And that's when our friend, friendship first started. Where was, uh, who was in the 86 finals? Uh, uh, Boston and Houston. Houston, Boston. Houston, Houston. Boston. Right. Yeah. right, right. Yeah. What's the story uh, behind this photo here? Can you recall actually – what was happening on that day or that's just one that was taken in amongst a, a whole flurry of things. That's a uh, lot of years ago. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't remember what was happening that day. I mean, wearing one of the original NBA shirts. That's yeah. for sure. It's fantastic. And, uh, it was some, it looked like a locker room in the background or something, but it was some, some shoot that we were doing. That's so, a great photo. How yeah. do you feel looking back on it all these years on? Yeah. <laughs> Nice to nice to have been young once, right, Ned? <laughs> uh, a lot of that's a lot of games between the two of us in the, since that photo. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's a fantastic. We were truly, purely partners in crime, I and mean, we still are. But you know, it was just just Nat and I for a long time. I mean, really, until we had I don't even know who the next person up was. Jesse came along much later, but maybe I started bringing Barry or something or. Right. Uh, Garrett, but you know, Nat and I would just do all these big events, just the two of us running around like like idiots with you know, didn't know which end was up. <laughs> and obviously, the the way that photos are now, uh, the whole digital age has come to be. Uh, it's a completely different scenario between how things started back in the nineteen eighties when you were doing things on film. Uh, I believe we did chat about it, Andy, when you guessed it on my podcast a few years ago, but. Um, Nat, when was the approximate time that you would have converted to be all digital? I know that Andy tried to hold off for as long as possible, if my memory serves. When did you change over to, to let the digital age come in? You know what? Same with me because I, I loved how the film looked. Um, I loved that we shot with the Hasselblad, the two and a quarter. It just mechanically, it's a beautiful camera. The different lenses were beautiful. The film was beautiful. But the needs started changing you know uh and people needed needed the material you couldn't shoot a game and wait three hours at the lab to get the film processed you know yeah. time times were changing um but it was it was 2003 and that was a big deal because of the class of 2003 with you know lebron wade mellow like that was sort of the next generation of all these young stars so through the course of that season um and we started uh you know switching to digital the original digital stuff was not great quality so we had to sort of i didn't want to go backwards in quality either right. but by then um it was it was starting to equal film mm -hmm. yeah i mean the original digital cameras were like like 
gigantic and they weighed, you know, I don't know what they weighed, 15 pounds. And the files were tiny and terrible. Um, so it was, it was uh, I mean, I didn't honestly believe that it was ever going to catch on, to be honest with you. <laughs> so, but, you know, you talk about the two and a quarter. I mean, this guy right here, my buddy, was truly one of the, if not the best, one of the best of the Hasselblad guys. I, I never really got the hang of it, honestly. I mean, I was good with it with remotes, but the handheld thing, I just could never really feel comfortable with it, honestly. And that, I think from day one, you did. You know, I just, I just, I just loved it right, right from the jump. Yep. So. With, um, in terms of current day, as far as what we've been happening uh, during this really strange time that we're living in at the moment, uh, just yesterday, the 10 part docuseries, The Last Dance, from ASPN uh, concluded and clearly your respective lives behind the lens are reflected in countless moments throughout those 10 episodes. Uh, yeah. It was an incredible series. I just absolutely loved it. Um, I'd love to know what your respective thoughts are on that. And is there a particular moment or a takeaway from any episode that particularly stood out to you above all others? Mm. You want to go, Nat, or you want me? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Start. Well, I, I think what stood out the most was just how epic that run was. I mean, we were there from the beginning, and we, Nat and I shot Michael Jordan, you know, as a rookie. So we were around um, his whole career. But that run of of six championships in eight years, uh, man, it was just something else. And then. You know, it's kind of fun to see each other and all our friends and all the people we've worked with, you know, in front of the camera, behind the camera, you know, throughout the series. That's been great. But the one moment that that, that I really want to point to is, is really the, the last shot. I mean, the last shot just kind of summed up everything for me in terms of teamwork, all of us, you know, really going for one goal, which was to to get that definitive picture which of course now lives on i mean i don't think we knew at the time the significance of it being the last picture of the last dance <laughs> you know but you know that's 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 what it's taken on and i'm i'm happy to have been part of that what about you nat that's fantastic to hear from Andy. you know uh, similarly in the in the moment not to equate yourself with one of the athletes but you're in the moment so you don't really have time to think about things yeah. you're working hard and and trying to to do your job and not really um don't really allow yourself mm -hmm. to get caught up in the moment you have you can't be caught up in the moment you have to you have to keep doing your job you know yeah. Yeah. um and it is fun you know 20 some years later to look back at things because you have a lot of memories we have a lot of friendships with uh, team personnel, league personnel over the years. Um, and I've loved it just like everyone else, waiting for the Sunday night to, to look forward to watching it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been special for me because I've been watching it with my two boys um, because they were too young to remember. Um, and that just as a parent, as a basketball fan, again, like everyone else sitting on the couch watching it, it's been uh, – it's been an awesome experience. Yeah, it's great to hear your memories. Thank you both for sharing them. Uh, at the moment, Andy. I believe you should be able to see on the screen the yeah. photo uh, that Andy, this is one of the photos that you sent through to me. Now, I believe, Nat, you were sitting on the opposite baseline, closest to Jordan, and no, as he released. Uh, well, yeah, right there. you can see me in this, in this photo. Uh, yep. I have a, a, a shot of him with the ball right on his hands, you see the shot, but you never see that photo because this one is so great. Yeah. Um, and Andy can speak to this. This is a, this is a, another photographer shot this uh, picture, but Andy was, Andy was the one pressing the, the trigger for a system that we used. Uh, and it, it does speak to the, the teamwork aspect of things. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love seeing you under the basket right there. I didn't even notice that until right. I looked at it today. <laughs> um, no, and I have a my my picture is is nice 
like when I first shot it, I knew I had it and I was like yeah. excited about it. But it's not as good as it's not as good as this one by any stretch because it, of the it tells you know, a story. Yeah. The crowd that you you do see the clock the clock, the people's faith, the Utah fan. And this it was just a crazy moment in NBA history right here. Yeah. I believe this was taken but, by the Orlando Magic photographer, Fernando Medina. Medina. And and also yeah. I saw you recently share it, Andy, and I think you had the hashtag teamwork. So as Nat alluded to there, what was involved behind getting this photo to happen in terms of uh, your role in, in the uh, photo as well. And then we'll get to another photo shortly, which shows Jordan celebrating just moments after the final buzzer there that, uh, that Nat took. Yeah. Well, not meaning to get like too photo technical about it, but we uh, back in the day <clears throat> and we still actually employ this system um, of these radio units that are attached to cameras that are remote cameras. So if you look really closely at this picture in the backboard, you'll see a bunch of cameras there, and those are all controlled through this system. And the, the cameras are all tied in to a single strobe system, which are these giant flashes that are up in the ceiling of the, in the catwalk. And only one photographer can be on a one strobe system at a time because you would blow the, the, the strobes. You would, you know, they need four seconds to recycle, so you can only get one picture every four seconds. Um, you can't be, you know, shooting with somebody else because it's a dedicated system. So we, we worked with some, uh, some tech guys to develop this multi-camera system that would fire these cameras at the same time with the same strobe burst. And in those days, we actually not only used these stationary remote cameras that were placed all over the arena, but we used human being remotes. <laughs> we call them human drones. And Fernando happened to be one of those, the two that were on my system, um, the other one being Scott Cunningham, who was at an elevated angle at midcourt, so that they would compose and they would focus, you know, follow the action. The only thing they wouldn't do would, would actually trigger the camera. They would, never, they would not push the trigger button to take the picture. I had to do that for them right because of the strobe system so when i push this auxiliary button this little button next to my shutter button my camera would go off right all the remotes would go off plus the human drone remote guys would go off so you're hoping that you you get a picture like this now the year before i don't know if you remember that but we kind of screwed up and uh, it wasn't you but it was the photographer who remained nameless who was supposed to get a picture like this at the finals and didn't and our boss called him out there at this finals and said, if this ever happens again, you got to be ready. Right? right. So he was ready. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, long story short, very long story short, I was in the corner to the left of Tony Kukoc over here, the very, very edge of the frame. And just as, and I'm following Michael as the play unfolded, and I can see Byron Russell stumble. And just as Michael elevated, Tony Kukoc gets in my way. So I can't, I don't see Michael anymore, but I saw the bottom of his feet <laughs> and I saw him elevate and, his, and I knew I had to bang the button. I had no picture. You know, my picture was of Tony Kukoc's back, but I knew that the two human drone guys had, you know, at least had the potential of getting the picture. And that's how this picture was made. Unbelievable. It's uh, crazy to hear the, 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 what happens behind the scenes for that to actually take place and, and come to be such an iconic photo as yeah. well. Uh, your, bo your boss that you're referring to, I, I assume, is the late, great David Stern? No, no. My, our photo's boss, Carmen Romanelli. <laughs> oh, he's okay. Now, Radio. He's now the head of... Uh, I don't even know if David Stern knew he were there at the time, Nat. But, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Carmen ran uh, NBA photos and now is the head of... Um, of license okay um let me just really change to how this system worked and uh you know it was truly a, a group effort fantastic now um what were you what are your memories nat of this moment unfolding you were there at the opposite end of the court as we said taking the photo uh how did you take in the moment as it unfolded you know what you knew michael was going to take the shot and then in that in that picture we just looked at you can see me uh, shooting, I'm looking down, looking through the Hasselblad, and you know, in basketball, there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts, yeah. and I was I had him him lined up, stayed right on him. You want 
the ball releasing the clock in the background. And I was waiting for a uh, car to clear a little because he, he was a big body that was in front of me and he slid a little to the left. And mm -hmm. then I, I took one, one frame. Yeah. And at the time I, I was thrilled. I loved it. And then I, like I said earlier, I saw this one. I was like, wow, that that's much better. And yeah. the elevated shot that Scott had, yeah. people don't see a lot. Yeah, uh, but it's an awesome uh, moment as well. So it is, it is cool to how it it speaks to the team effort. Yeah, yeah un unbelievable. So uh, thankfully, uh, Tony Q coach and also Antoine Carr didn't uh, quite put the kibosh on the photo. Never, <laughs> never happening. So uh, that's good right. to hear. How about this photo here, Nat, that I, hopefully you'll be able to see on the screen? This is one that yeah, you sent me yeah. ahead of our chat today. Can you talk us through just being right there at the moment to capture that uh, moment there as Jordan's holding up the six fingers well, for the six titles? After Michael hit that, hit that shot um, that we were just talking about, Utah gets the ball. They call the timeout. Mm -hmm. um, and John Stockton had a really good look I, at a three. Like he probably – whatever i'm not a big stat guy but 40 50 percent of the time he nails that you know yeah, he, yeah. he missed it and you know it's just bedlam so at that time we just run out on the court uh, and i was fortunate enough to get michael he didn't do it for a long time but arms up giving the the sixth sign you yeah. know um it's and, crazy that there's no tv guy like he must have been next um, to you or something you know what i i we always try not to get in front of the TV guys and get yeah. next to them. I'm assuming he's next to me. Yeah. Um, huh. And like, just, just sort of one of my favorite shots because it says it all, you know? Yeah, I love that. Um, and that was, that was, you know, mm -hmm. his, his last, uh, his last hurrah there. Yeah. Remarkable. Yes. What, what did you do Andy after the final buzzer went, what were your motions in the following seconds? Do you recall? Uh, I don't remember, honestly. I, I know I ran out on the court. Um, I haven't seen any of my photos from the court, like ever. So I don't. I don't know. Maybe I. Maybe stuff didn't work. You know, you're depending on a radio uh, to trigger strobes, and once you run out on the court, back in the early radio days, they it wasn't very. Well, what, you know. It was crazy because it brought back memories watching the watching the doc because yeah. after after they win they do the trophy and we're shooting all that stuff they go they went into the locker room for a little bit uh, yeah. which we were back there and got some really nice moments but then they, they never they never showered or never never took off their their jerseys and they showed yeah. that last night in the doc they went yeah. hopped on the bus yeah. I thought it was very cool by the way Carl Malone getting on the bus. Yeah. Congratulate them. How difficult that must have been for him. Yeah, I don't remember that happening. Yeah. Crazy yeah. show of sportsmanship. I remember being on the bus. Then I got off the bus uh -huh. uh, to go break down all these cameras. You guys continued on yeah. with Michael up to his suite. And yeah. they showed the, like playing the piano and singing. And then, like, and it's, it's unbelievable. And he's still, he's still in his jersey. He's still got the, you know, champagne-soaked jersey and T-shirt on. It's crazy they didn't take they didn't take a shower. That's no. really crazy. Um, it's no. also crazy that they didn't fly back to Chicago that night because the game ended early. Michael had that line when he comes out of the arena saying, "Oh, it's still light out. I could play some golf now or something." <laughs> well, I think you you have a little uh, you know little post game activities planned. Yeah. You don't, want, you don't yeah. want to get right on the plane. You want to enjoy that yeah. as long as you as long yeah. as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk to that uh, moment up in that hotel room, Andy? Because in the background of those shots, you can see yourself there taking photos. Yeah. Uh, did that sort of bring back some great memories for you at that time? Well, or like, what can you yes tell us about no. those? Yes and no. I, uh, my, our <laughs> boss at the time, Carmen, said, All right, you, you know, you got to go to the hotel and, and just find where they are, you know, if they're having a, they, We didn't know if they're going to be, they had a ballroom or, it's going to be on their suite level or whatever. So I get over there and I don't know how I found out, but I knew that to go up to the, this one floor, which they had the whole floor. And once I get off the elevator, it literally reminded me of being back in college, you know, like dorm, crazy party central, like champagne bottles everywhere. The first, this is a true story. The first room I walk into 
It's got Dennis Rodman and Carmen Electra in there, you know, drinking and having a great time. This is the craziest scene ever. And then I'm hearing a lot of commotion down the hall in the presidential suite. And I go in there and it's packed. And uh, Michael's in there sitting at the piano, um, big stogie, you know. And Michael Jordan, I think, is really great at a lot of things, but he does not know how to play the piano. And he knew he didn't know how to play the piano, but it was just so, such a moment. And uh, it's funny in the documentary how he joked about at the practice about having a, a piano in his suite. Right, right. right. He was, ever. he was practicing that Gatorade song. He wanted to play that one Gatorade song. <laughs> but everybody wanted to be like Mike. Be like Mike, yeah. yeah. Could have been the one the one thing he knew how to play. Yeah, so that was all great, a great memory, Adam. And the pictures were great. And it was a fun night. And I was able to kind of take it in a little bit. And, uh, you know, I was literally next to the greatest sports photographer of all time, Walter Yost, who was in there, like right next to me. That was amazing. Um, but, you know, fast forward the next day, I caught pneumonia and uh, I was sick for two weeks. Oh, and, wow. Uh, oh, I didn't know I, that. I, yeah, I ran out of the arena soaking wet, right? And you see me in the dog, I got the towel around me. But it was like a little bit of a cool evening and I had to run to the hotel, which is probably 10 blocks away with my gear. And uh, probably didn't get to sleep until, or maybe I didn't even go to bed at all. But I got back to LA, I had like 102 fever. I was in bed for two weeks. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, That's not never. good. It wasn't some bad pizza that you ate by any chance, was it? No, it was just, uh, you know, heat of the battle, so to speak. <laughs> that was uh, interesting how they, uh, it wasn't initially the flu game that they referred yeah. to. They were saying it was some bad pizza, perhaps uh, food yeah. poisoning. Um, yeah. That's uh, yeah, some great memories there. Thank you both for for continuing to share them. And another photo, uh, Nat, that you sent me ahead of our chat today. I'll just share this to the, hopefully this will pop up. It's from the 1987 NBA Finals, and it's the uh, iconic Junior Junior Skyhook. Junior Junior, yeah. Uh, the tremendous photo here of Magic uh, in amongst the trio of Hall of Famers, uh, yeah. Bird, Parish, McHale. Uh, can you uh, please talk us through this? Great black and white photo, which is uh, obviously one of your favorites, Nat. You know what? That again, a little bit of a little bit of luck never hurts. Mm. Uh, being on that side of the court, being able to get that moment. But this speaks to what uh, we were talking about earlier about not digital. This was film. Uh, you shoot it. I remember he he hit it. There was two seconds left, and pretty much like ran off the court right after he hit it. Uh, <laughs> And you hope that you get the shot. Yeah. Um, we don't know. We break down. I was set. I was shooting black and white um, because in those days a lot of newspapers didn't even use color. And Andy was shooting on strobe. Uh, we're both shooting for the league to document the history, but mm -hmm. people had different needs. A lot of newspapers and NBA publications just ran black and white. Yeah. Um, but after the game, we run back to the hotel i'm shaking up the canisters and developing film in the hotel you're holding it up and i was like yeah we got it you know um did so there's a lot of a lot of angst sequence there. in that net did you shoot a motor drive sequence you know? you know what it's funny i don't i don't remember i think in those days my cameras were so old <laughs> like it was it was just the motor was too slow right you know those md12 yeah and i was just you know, one frame and that was it. And thankfully, and it's cool, it's cool. Like you look at it, it's, it's, you know, four hall of famers there, you know, yeah. and even magic at one time made a comment that it was one of his, uh, one of his favorite shots, which made me feel good. Cause I, unlike Andy, I don't, I didn't see the Lakers much, you know, yeah. Yeah. being an East coast. Um, yeah. but then that, that was game four and the, the, uh, Lakers won in six that year. Yeah. Yeah, that's an amazing picture. Fantastic photo. Absolutely fantastic. It's such, um, a, such an old time picture too. I mean, you see the, the whole kind of depth of Boston Garden with the overhanging uh, balconies and all right. that stuff. Right. Uh, yeah, I was, I was wondering, a, lot, a lot of oh, memories. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I was wondering if there was a reason for the black and white, but it just looks so great in black and white. So, um, yeah. I think it was a, obviously a, a fantastic choice and uh, 
I didn't realize it was the, the reason perhaps because the newspapers didn't often print a lot of color photos at that time. I didn't think about it from that way. Um, the next photo I'd love to share, I've got two monitors going. So when I look off to the side, I'm just trying yeah. to find the next yeah. photo for you. This is a, a great one that um, Andy, that you sent through ahead of time today. And I'll open it up in a moment. It's from the 1991 NBA finals. And uh, it's mm -hmm. the one with uh, the iconic photo of Jordan cradling the uh, NBA championship trophy with his late father, James, at his side. Yeah. I'll just share the screen in just a moment, but I'd love to, we did talk, I believe a little bit about this when you guessed it on the podcast a few years ago, but I'd certainly love to hear your recollections of, of how this one came to be as well. Just a, another iconic photo. Well, this is, you know, has uh, taken on a lot of significance in a lot of ways. It's Michael's first championship and, and uh, you know, his dad being in the photo and we all know what happened to his dad, you know, especially from watching Michael's reaction um, during the last dance and um, and it was a, just a crazy chaotic moment back in the day the, the network used to do the trophy presentation to the winning team in the visiting locker room or in the home locker room they didn't do it on the court so the, the locker room at the forum was like a glorified closet and you know, all hell was breaking loose in there I mean it was insane champagne's flying everywhere there's all kinds of people and their family members, media, and they're trying to do this trophy presentation like in this little like corner of the locker room. And the only vantage point I could get and see anything was I jumped up on bridge table in the middle of the, of the room. So I could at least see, you know, what was going on. And then, uh, you know, all of a sudden they, they stopped the, the trophy presentation. They went to commercial and then they wanted to get Michael for an, a one-on-one -on -one interview live, but they couldn't find him. And everyone's desperately looking for him. And I don't know, some sixth sense just said, look to your left for some reason. I remember it just turned to my left and boom, there he was in this locker. And I just kneeled down and banged off a few frames. And uh, like Nats, you're probably in this picture in the, in the reflection somewhere. Right, right. I think. Um, and it was super cool to see it in the documentary because um, they have this moment, but sort of around a little bit. So you could actually see me in the ball, like with the flash going off. <laughs> this is crazy. I had never seen that footage before. So that was, that was awesome. How about you, Nat? What do you recall about being in amongst all this uh, mayhem that was going on at the time uh, in 1991? You know what, to Andy's point, it's, it is very chaotic, you know, and you have a job to do, you have to document it, but you have to give people space and, you know, t there's TV cameras in there and, and they're usually the, the priority. Um, but I was right on the other, other side um, and, you know, there was a moment of him alone with the trophy and yeah. his, mom, his mom was uh, in, there as, in, in there as well. Yeah. Um, and it was just pretty, like, it's, it's pretty special, you know, and then, you know, like you said, you have the, the uh, opportunity to look back over time and realize um, that we we're pretty fortunate to be able to document that for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the beginning of uh, the last dance, you know, literally the beginning, the first right. dance. Yeah. So. Remarkable. Uh, it's just fantastic to have this opportunity with you both to share this. Uh, thanks yeah. again for your time. Just a, another photo or two that I may have before we sort of put a bow on this conversation. It's been great to speak with you both. Uh, let me just find the next one. I think this is uh, the only one we haven't yet spoken about. And uh, this is a photo of the the late, great Kobe Bryant yeah. that uh, Andy that you sent through. Um, and I'll just get the share the screen here so we can all see it. Uh, yeah. This one here is an incredible one where he's uh, just, You've got it right up uh, close here as he's uh, about to throw down a monster dunk. Um, yeah, well, people probably don't know or maybe don't remember as much, but the, the young Kobe, like the pre-Mamba, was like a dunking machine. I mean, that, that kid would just, you'd probably get, I don't know, five or six dunks a game out of him. Um, not all of them is spectacular, you know, as this one turned out to be, but... Um, this is uh, probably the 
first year at Staples Center, I think. So it was probably the 99-2000 season. It's against New Jersey. It was a regular season game. And um, one of the things Nat and I would always set up would be a Hasselblad camera with a wide angle lens through the glass of the backboard. And this happened to be shot with that. And you can just see the difference. I mean, I don't think you have to be a photographer to really see how deep this picture is and how it just is a different look than in a digital 35 millimeter picture. I don't know. It's hard to describe. Uh, it's crazy beautiful to freeze that moment. Yeah. You realize how hard he's throwing it. It's frozen. The yeah. beat sweat on his face, his expression. Yeah. That's, that's a timeless classic. Crazy. crazy. Photo. And it's you know, what was crazy. crazy too, Adam was that, you know, we were shooting film. So obviously you, your roll of film has, you know, an in, a finite number. And these Hasselblads, you could only get film that, that shot 24 frames. Um, sometimes it was 12, but we had these film backs that shot 24 frames. And you had to kind of sort of remember in your head how many remote pictures you took because you couldn't change film until the quarter break. Um, so, you know, end of first quarter, halftime, end of third quarter, you just can't be bringing ladders out there, you know, during a timeout and stuff to change film. So, you know, sometimes we couldn't change film at all. Some, some arenas um, in the catwalk, for example, you set the camera up and you had 24 shots. That's all you got because they wouldn't let you up in the catwalk during the game or let your assistant up there, you know? So, um, you know, that was something that we always had to be very conscious of. And going back to the Jordan um, last second shot, I was thinking about that today that I, who knows where I was on the film counter at that point. You know? <laughs> Could have been the 36th shot for all I know. Uh, but, you know, same with you, man. I and mean, you were probably shooting 120 backs or 220 backs maybe. Yeah, no, I was always conscious. You had to be conscious of um, – Yeah of the count and I, often most most of my arenas you couldn't change it was 24 for that for the for the entire game yeah, yeah they wouldn't even let you go out at half no no yeah. but well worth it you get a shot like that well worth it yeah yeah for sure unbelievable just a remarkable array of photos that we've uh, had a, a chance to chat about today and thank you very much both of you for your time uh would you like to just briefly talk andy to your book that you released, Mamba Mentality. Uh, I'd love for you just to briefly talk about the involvement that you had with, with uh, of course, Kobe and your very close relationship that you had. Uh, do you mind just talking about that for just yeah, a moment? No, of course. no, I was very, very fortunate to, to be uh, the Lakers photographer when he was a rookie in, in 96. And by then, um, I'd been in the league for 13 years. So kind of a, within the organization, I had built a some trust in a relationship, you know, with Pat Riley and magic and Mitch Kupchak and Jerry West and, you know, everybody. So, you know, he, he had been, I guess, following my photos um, as a kid um, as well as Nat's photos, a lot of people's photos because he was just, you know, a student of the game. So he said he knew who I was, he recognized my pictures and we just hit it off from the beginning. He was a very, very unique kid at 18 years old very focused and driven and uh, incredibly curious about everything all the time. And, um, you know, it's just a unique opportunity for a photographer to be, to have one subject, you know, whether it's, you know, a musician or an athlete, it doesn't matter, you know, a politician, but to have that subject in front of your lens for 20 years, you know, it's just amazing. And, you know, now, I think it's impossible almost for one athlete to be with one team for 20 years, the way everything is structured with the money and all that. But, um, you know, I was very lucky to have taken his first professional picture as a Laker, his last, and, you know, a lot of them in between. And we got to, he got to his retirement um, year and towards, you know, well, after all-star break, I just realized that there was so much material that had not been published and that I, I just felt a need to, get a lot of that out. And I talked with him and his marketing team about doing it, just like sort of a greatest hits kind of book, which he didn't want to do. He wanted to do a book with me, but he wanted it to be the book, a book where he teaches about what it really meant 
to be the, the Mamba and break his own game down and his, his process and his craft and everything he put into becoming who he was. And, um, you know, it was, it was a gift. I mean, it was a real gift from him to allow me to be able to illustrate that with my pictures. And, you know, what's, what's just amazing now is the, the book is, is, is continued now, you know, with his passing to be a bridge and to be a connection between those of us who knew him and were around him, but even, you know, the young generation and fans who were great fans of his and now trying to teach their kids about him. And i um, very thankful that we had the opportunity to do the book together and that now it, it sort of lives on and preserves his legacy. Yeah, beautifully said. And also you, um, you were able to get Kobe on your podcast too, Legends of Sport. Yeah. Uh, was it a two-part? I think it was a two-part episode. No, the, the no. one with Magic was two parts. Oh, Magic but, was uh, two parts. So you had uh, Kobe, Kobe on the was show. Great. No, he was very generous with that. And he, um, he was just incredible. And he knew that I was trying to build this Legends of Sport platform with the podcast and the, to have him on talking about our book and then, you know, about his career. It was just really, really helped me. And uh, it just goes to show what, how generous a person he was, you know, mm -hmm. he wasn't really financially or anything, getting anything out of the book, but he saw it as a great vehicle to connect with his fans, but also to help really to help me. And it, it really did. Yeah. That's wonderful. And maybe just one last question for you, Nat, before we do wrap things up, if you don't mind, you were mostly based on the, the East coast as far as uh, your photography years uh, over the decades. Um, how was it uh, covering maybe the New York Knicks? I know you're a New York fan and you attended St. John's. Uh, what was it like to cover those Knicks um, and sort of see some of the struggles they had against those epic uh, matchups in the playoffs with the Bulls and just that whole 1990s where the Knicks were such a, a, a fascinating team to watch uh, in the many incarnations that they had? You know, it was, it was really uh, special. Um, and one thing about this Jordan doc that, that some of the, the younger people uh, will now realize is, yes, the Bulls won six titles, but it was not easy. Mm. Like, they didn't roll over people. Like, they had battles against – they had lost to Detroit. They finally beat Detroit. But they had battles. The Knicks had win it. You know, the Knicks were up 2-0. They'd come back, win a series. Those Indiana teams were really good. <laughs> yeah, you know? the game seven. They it, won. Yeah. You know, there's a fine line. Utah, Michael hits that shot against Utah. They won by two points, I think. It wasn't yeah. like they were blowing. There was one crazy blow. It wasn't like they were blowing people out and sweeping. The, and it's cool because you realize then you have more of an appreciation because of how difficult it was. Those, yeah. Knicks, those Knicks were a, a bounce here or a bounce there. And the Knicks would have been there. Indiana could have been there, you know. Right. Uh, so being there in those moments, the garden is a special place, uh, always uh, has been. Mm -hmm. So it, it's been, uh, it was really fun for me to do that. And hopefully, uh, you know, Brooklyn's going to make some noise soon. For me personally, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of interest and in, vested interest <laughs> uh, in a couple of those guys and a lot of friends over in Brooklyn now. Yeah. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to, uh, to getting back to uh, those big games. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, it's been a pleasure to have both you gentlemen join me today. It's been uh, great to ha have a chance to speak with you both. Uh, your collective experience is just astonishing between you over the decades. So uh, it's been a real thrill. And uh, I'll make sure I include links to both your respective Instagram accounts where you've been sharing some wonderful photos, particularly during this pandemic we're living through. Uh, mm -hmm. Please stay safe as we try and work our way through this. And uh, just one last time, thanks again for, for chatting with me today to both of you, Andy and Nat. No, thanks for having us, Adam. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Great to see you, man.